early years of the NFL, interest in the game was due largely to the exploits of offensive stars like Red Grange and Sammy Ball. Players who excelled on defense were virtually anonymous. Two things changed that. One was the growing influence of television that served to isolate strategies on both sides of the line. The other was the rise of the New York Giants defense. Under the leadership of a young assistant coach named Tom Landry, they captured the public's imagination by not only out-hitting, but often out-thinking opposing offenses. From 1956 to 1963, they led New York to six conference titles and one NFL championship. And in doing so, they gave a new definition to that formerly obscure word, defense. It is the most tribal and universal of football fan rituals. Yet there are those among NFL historians who believe that this battle cry was first chanted in the mid-1950s, originating from the rafters of New York's Yankee Stadium. In a game that climaxed the NFL's first season of nationally televised broadcasts, millions of home viewers heard the deafening roar and watched a very responsive giant defense. The Giants' crushing championship win over the Chicago Bears was the beginning of an eight-year era that saw a whole new type of slugging power come to the fabled house that Ruth built. It began when head coach Jim Lee Howell added a young Tom Landry to his already talented staff of assistants. Landry's innovative mind melded together with men like Jimmy Patton, Andy Robostelli, Jim Katkavich, Rosie Greer, and Dick Mojaleski to produce the NFL's most dominant and difficult to detect defense of its day. They were the first defensive team that all of a sudden started putting the good athletes over on defense. Up to that time, the better athletes, especially linemen, uh, running backs were on the on the offensive side and all of a sudden they started putting a little better athlete uh, then also they went and started studying offensive formations and what teams were doing which is what Tom does it was a first Landry and that group had put together a defense that uh, had certain uh, refinements to it that the offenses hadn't caught on to yet one of those refinements was the creation of the 4-3 defense, designed to take advantage of the instinctive skills of middle linebacker Sam Huff. In this defense, the job of the four down linemen was to keep Huff free of potential blockers, leaving him free to act as a rover, whose task was to be in the vicinity of the football. This scheme was one of a number of ploys the Giants successfully used to neutralize their main nemesis, number 32, Jimmy Brown. Sam was basically the quarterback of that defense, and he had the flair to understand that he was in New York, so he became an instant celebrity by attaching himself to my legs quite often. We hit him whether he had the ball or not, and we knew that we had to stop Brown because their offense was built around him. Why shouldn't you? you know, the man averaged 5.2 yards a carry lifetime. Uh, we had to stop Jim Brown to beat the Cleveland Browns. And we were able to do it because of, of the defense we had in those days. We played a, what we called the coordinated defense. We were able to shut down the gaps for him where he couldn't find the gap to get through. And, and we were successful, probably better than anybody. No one stops him completely, obviously. He's too great a back to have that happen. But we slowed him down enough so that we ended up in the late 50s of being in a lot of championship games and Cleveland was. In addition to capably handling their rivals from Cleveland, the Giants' defense also became highly proficient at putting points on the board. This mixture of creative stratagems and game day opportunism endeared this unit to their fans. Along with the public praise and adulation, media attention was for the first time devoted to a defense. Giant defenders were not portrayed as mindless brutes, 
but rather as a team-oriented group of friendly, thoughtful, and articulate men. This high-gloss treatment, however, did not wear well with all of their teammates. There was a lot of animosity, a lot of jealousy between the offensive unit and the defensive unit because the defense really came into prominence for the first time, I guess, in the history of pro football. In those days, they didn't even introduce the defensive ball players. It was only the offensive ball players that were introduced before the game. And it was always, you know, ladies and gentlemen, number 16 from Southern California, Frank Gifford. In those days, when uh, Sam Huff was maybe making uh, eight or 9,000 and fighting Wellington Mara to make it 10, uh, I might have been making 18 or 20. That didn't sit too well with the likes of a Sam Huff. There was a little animosity about that because we were doing, on defense, we were doing an awful lot of playing and we were holding teams, you know, to, to six points and to three points. And we went three games, I remember, and never scored a touchdown offensively. And we won two of them. At one period, you know, when we'd come off the field, uh, Sam might say, see if you can hold them, we'll try and score on defense the next time around. Despite the presence of any ill will, those who came into contact with this unit grudgingly agreed that they were pioneers in the effort to bring teamwork and intellect to defense. The most intelligent def defensive club in football, New York Giants. Every man knew his position, knew what he was supposed to do, knew where he was supposed to help out. They played together probably as well as any team I've ever coached. They had just a sense of feel, you know, between each other. It was a good football team, it was, it was good talent, but it wasn't really any better than, than some of the teams in those days. But their ability to play together and believe in each other, the way they believed in each other, was tremendous. In 1960, Tom Landry moved on to coach the Dallas Cowboys, but the men he left behind went on to play in three more NFL championships. Although the Giants came up short in each of them, their defense performed bravely particularly in the bitter defensive struggles against Green Bay in 1962 and Chicago in 1963. Ironically, a dynasty both began and ended with a title game against the Bears. But while one era was passing on, a new one was dawning. Various retirements and trades closed this chapter of defensive brilliance. But a symbolic seed was transplanted with Rosie Greer's transfer to the Rams, where he helped give celebrity status to Los Angeles' suddenly famous fearsome foursome. It was a start of a colorful age in professional football, where dominant defenses no longer lacked adulation and recognition. So whether they were called the Purple People Eaters, the Steel Curtain, or Doomsday, all of them owed a small debt of gratitude to a group of men who came together in New York's Yankee Stadium and who